So, Gilchor Yang, thank you very much, John Mason, for coming to talk to me. This is the third Future Proof interview I'm doing. But could you just tell us a bit about yourself and your involvement with the Skeptical Science website? Yes, well, I'm a geologist by training. Did my degree at Aberystwyth. And so I've always had an interest in the earth sciences, deep interest. Although my research subject is mineralogy, it doesn't mean you don't take interest in other areas of, of that field. And um, so I became aware of climate change mostly through the emergence of quite vociferous and often of fairly offensive arguments on internet forums and um, below the line discussions at the Guardian. I thought, well, there's something going on here. Pe people are actually lying about the science. They're distorting and misrepresenting what the science says. And I became quite annoyed by it, by this, as you can imagine. And um, after a bit of email correspondence with a guy called John Cook in Australia, I got invited to join the team. It's a team of international team of volunteers that runs the Skeptical Science website. And um, so I joined that in 2011, and I've been a contributor there ever since, basically. The website basically exists to provide a, a counterpoint to all the myths that climate change deniers use. We maintain an online database of these myths. There are 198 in our database, basically different lies that are told to try and discredit mainstream climate science. And a lot of your work is focused on debunking the myths of climate that, denial. That's the core of the site, yes. Mm. Um, you know, it means that people who've read something in the Daily Mail, for example, can go on there look at what they've read and, and see if it's true or not. Um, because what, what we do is we show the myth and then we explain what the science says. And the almost all myths have three different levels of, of uh, um, intensity in terms of the science. So you have a basic level rebuttal, an intermediate one and an advanced one. Mm. So depending on your, um, your uh, scientific ability, it's still possible to look those myths up, even if you're not a trained scientist, and find out the truth. And everything we say is fully referenced as well. We, we link back to the peer-reviewed literature everywhere. So if anyone disputes what, something we're saying, they can go to the literature and check it out for themselves. And, you know, that, that, that's our credibility, basically. Also, we provide a lot of content in the form of blog posts. So we, we have a series, running series of New research, for example, which is you know new, new stuff that's being published in the literature. Um, that's that's very popular, and we have various blog posts on, on, on things that are topical at the time, such as Arctic sea ice melt in, in in the late summer and so on and so forth. Could you just tell us briefly how climate denial begins and what are its main arguments? Yeah. Um, well, you have to go back to 1982, basically, and um, at that time, believe it or not, Exxon, the big petrochemical giant, it had a research department investigating climate change, and their scientists came up with exactly the same thing at mainstream science, saying now, um, some, some years later, of course, the Kyoto Protocol was agreed. That's what kicked it all off, because there was word of intent to make massive changes in the way we live our lives, which, which we must do if we're to counter climate change. And a consortium of petrochemical industry giants and conservative think tanks, particularly in the USA, but also in Australia and uh, some other countries, got together and basically said, we're going to fight this. And... Uh, what they wanted to do was portray far greater uncertainty in the science than was the case. And so once you get these conservative think tanks involved, they're spewing out misinformation right left and centre. Um, it, it, it's gone on to this day. And of course, with the advent of the internet, that became 10 times easier again. Um, some of the attempts have been quite successful. I mean, they, they, it, it can be stated that they've managed to derail progress, real progress on climate change for several decades. Um, 
others have been less successful. I mean, what, what, one think tank, the Heartland Institute in the States, it uh, ran a poster campaign with photos of Osa Osama bin Laden and the Unabomber with the caption underneath saying, I believe in climate change, do you? <laughs> um, that, that particular campaign got pulled quite quickly because the industry giants realised it was a blunder and, and they ordered it to be uh, pulled. But um, So they, they, they go to various lengths to do these things. Um, of course, there was, there was a famous fo false uh, scandal of Climategate in 2009 when a huge tranche of emails were stolen from the uh, climate research units at the University of East Anglia and uh, I, I'm in there somewhere <laughs> because I, I talked to these scientists and they were cherry picked and all the all the sort of fishy bits were pulled out and link, linked together and spread all around the internet and um, they throw bits of mud at a wall knowing full well that if they throw enough some of it will stick. So what are their more popular Believe, more popularly believe myths? What are their main arguments? These, these, these kind of morph through time as circumstances allow. I mean, uh, you know, a very popular one years ago was it's the sun, i.e. the energy output from the sun is changing. Um, unfortunately for the deniers, solar irradiance has been declining slightly, whereas the temperature has, has gone up, so the two diverge if you plot them together on a graph. And... Um, you know, so they, the, the deniers have their very own divergence problem there. Um, quite a few of them these days are turning more to a either it's too late or it's con it's not not as bad as we thought it would be. And there are of course famous arguments like just repeating CO2 is plant food. Um, yes, it is, but uh, that's irrelevant. <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, another one. It's only a trace gas. Well, just to cite a couple of examples, if you read a health and safety fact sheet on hydrogen sulfide by dead gas, 500 ppm of that in the air will make you quite unwell. 1,000 ppm will likely kill you. So trace gas doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. Another one is gold. If you found a mountain containing 30 ppm of gold, you'd make millions because that's it. High grade gold ore, 30 ppm. So they they come up with simplistic but easily debunkable, debunkable arguments. And one technique is to just throw as many of those at a person as they can in a given amount of time. It's, it's known as the Gish Gallop after Dwayne Gish in the U USA who uses it for other purposes in, in uh, creationism and stuff like that. So you're throwing these factoids at, at somebody so fast that they have, haven't got a chance to properly debug any of them. So that's a, that's a well-known technique. Hmm. Who are the sort of main voices today still propagating these myths? Where, where are the main outlets? The main promoters, I would say nowadays, are less so the oil companies. So, so, some have some involvement, others are are moving away from that sort of stuff and they're moving away from fossil fuels of course I mean that's some some of the companies are investing quite heavily in renewables now um, I, I would say the main propo pr propagators of uh, climate change denialism today are still the conservative think tanks we've got one in this country called the global warming policy foundation it sounds dead serious but um, their material is easily debunked um, so they, they form a network, an echo chamber, if you like. So they, any, any new myth that comes up gets echoed from one place to the other. Bang, 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 bang. Um, and you've got the billionaire-owned right-wing press, like the Daily Mail, the, the Express, and so on. And um, they're quite happy to uh, run with these things, too. Um, you know, they they only care about themselves, basically. They, they don't care about their readers. They, they, they want their readers to maintain their sort of level of blind ignorance, it seems. Absolutely. So, turning to the other side of the argument now, uh, I think it would be really informative for lots of people just to know, you know, how old is the science of climate change and how established is the evidence by today? You know, why, 
to play devil's advocate, why should we take it seriously? Okay. Um, we can trace it back to the 1820s. They'd already worked out the Earth's sun distance to within about 96% of the correct figure back then using trigonometry. It was an extraordinary feat. And a French guy, uh, John Joseph Baptiste Fourier, he was an engineer who worked for Napoleon. And after Napoleon had died, he carried on in his various research programs. And he was interested in the behaviour of heat. And he was the first one to work out that at this distance from the sun, as, as measured a, f a few decades previously, Earth should be a frozen ball of ice. Yeah. And he, he came up with the idea that there must be some kind of insulating blanket in the atmosphere that let through the luminous heat, as it was called, called that then, which is sunlight, but impeded the return flow of the non-luminous heat, which we now know as infrared radiation from the ground. Now, he, he couldn't do much more than that at the time, but... By the 1850s, things have moved on, and the confirmation of the, there was a greenhouse effect happened independently in London and in New York State. Um, in New York, a female scientist, Eunice Foot, ran experiments using a tube filled with various gases and measured their, their effects on sunlight. And she was the first person to actually connect carbon dioxide to the greenhouse effect. Um, a few years later, J John Tyndall in London did a slightly different experiment that came up with the same results. So he, that's that's quite interesting because to independently arrive at the same conclusion within a few years of each other, separated by thousands of miles of ocean, is quite impressive. And sometime later, a guy called Svante Arrhenius in Sweden actually managed to calculate the effects that doubling the level of CO2 in Earth's atmosphere would have, and he came up with a warning of uh, 3 to 6 degrees Celsius. Now, he didn't foresee a time when CO2 levels would double, because he was aware of the emissions of that time, around 1896, and, of course, they were a fraction of today's, so he was remarkably close to what we now know as the, the currently accepted figure of 2 to 4 degrees, possibly higher. Hmm. And then, you know, there's there's been a, a steady evolution in the science up until this very day. Mm -hmm. There are vast departments and universities especially studying this now. So the accumulation of knowledge hasn't changed the underlying theory in any way, has it? It's grown and grown. Um, one of the most important um, developments was after the end of the Second World War, of course, we went straight into the Cold War then. And, of course, jet, jet planes were around by then. And there was a great interest in infrared because, of course, a jet exhaust is an infrared hotspot. It's the hottest thing up there by miles. So if you can design a missile that homes in on such a, a hotspot, you can shoot down incoming hostile aircraft, heat-seeking missile. And in that research, the whole atmosphere is dissected. They're, they're, of course newly founded computer power at the time so they're able to perform the calculations required to do that and a landmark paper came out in 1956 by Gilbert Plass which summarized all this research and it was called the carbonic acid theory of climate change now note that the term climate change was being used back then a popular denialist myth is to say they changed global warming into climate change because global warming wasn't happening this is complete nonsense, of course, because Gilbert Plask uses the term climate change in 1956. Um, and since then, I mean, the, 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 the volume of evidence has grown and grown and grown, as, of course, as the physical evidence placed in front of us. We've seen serious melting in Greenland, West Antarctica, all-time lows in Arctic sea ice repeatedly. Um, you know, most most of the warmest years on, on record have been in the past ten, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, the the evidence that's denied by deniers is, is undeniable, basically. 
I keep feeling like we need to reiterate and, and rehearse these same arguments over and over again because there's still lots of people who who aren't sure because mm. they, they get conflicting information. But in your opinion, how likely is it that, that the current uh, evidence and modelling for climate change are in any way flawed or wrong? I mean, are they more accurate than they were? Or There are areas of uncertainty. I mean, there are in all areas of science. And to give, give one example, the current pandemic, I mean... Uh, the, the, the search for a vaccine is, is a very intense one, but there are huge areas of uncertainty. That's why they're not just putting something in the test tube going, oh, that appears to work, and injecting everyone with, with it. Because six months later, everyone might drop dead. That's, that's why we address uncertainty and do careful testing to make sure. Um, but the basic tenets of climate change are unchanged since the days of Arrhenius. Unfortunately. Unfortunately, <laughs> yes, indeed. So what signs of climate change can we see today? Firstly, you have to think globally. Um, you know, we're sat, sat here on the side of the Dovey Valley. And if you look around you, there aren't that many obvious signs here. Um, but if you look at the wildfires in Australia and the western USA, for example, they've been incredibly intense. Look up at the Arctic, particularly. Uh, at the melt there, you look, look to Siberia and the uh, permafrost melt, with mysterious holes appearing in the ground there. Um, so there's a whole sort of linked series of signs all, all around the world. A place, a place like this with a temperate maritime climate is less likely to be affected by extremes like that. Although if you look down here, all, the, all this forest here was completely flattened in one hour in, in 2014. I, ca I came up um, a day or two later and had a walk around with the groundsman and um, all this space here was basically mature conifer forest and the whole lot went. So, so we are seeing some more extreme weather conditions. Um, the bigger, bigger threat for whales, I would say, is it, it's twofold. Um, there's more prolonged periods of a certain weather type because the jet stream is starting to slow down and meander more like a river does as it comes out of the mountains into a valley. So, you know, we we may see weeks on end of dry weather or conversely weeks on end of wet weather, not necessarily at the times of year that we're used to seeing them. Um, because agriculture is such a big part of the local life that, that that has a big big impact, and the, the the impact on agriculture is is potentially major, and uh, it's it's already putting farmers under pressure. Um, you know, it looks lovely today, but um, you know, the particular one a few years ago was a, an extremely wet September, and they were having to put cattle in, indoors and feed them as early as that, and of course that that eats into their winter feed, and then the the guys who market the winter feed, once they run out of their silage, they put the prices up. And, um, you know, so it, it hits them hard that way. Mm. But the, uh, the the bigger threat to, to the valley here, long term, is sea level rise. When the, this, this section of the river is tidal. So, you know, it doesn't take much sea level rise to, to start to physically alter the appearance of the valley. And on that, I mm. mean, there have been many, many studies over the years um, on uh, the the melting of various ice sheets. Mm. And there was a recent study this year led by Potsdam University in Germany that showed melting of the Antarctic sea ice sheet means we are already looking at a sea level rise of two and a half metres, even if we manage to keep warming below two degrees. Mm. So what would a two and a half metre sea level rise mean for this part of Wales, for example? Yeah, well, it, this study is probably talking about West Antarctica, which is the wiggly bit that sticks out the top of Antarctica, if you like. Um, that is regarded as particularly prone to ice sheet loss. And it's important here to note that it's ice sheets on land as a matter here. Um, sea ice melts, it's, it's already in the water, so it doesn't make any difference at all. But land ice melting does rise sea level and 
you've also got to take into account that one eye sheet doesn't melt all on its own. So you've also got the Greenland eye sheet. So two and a half meters is possibly a minimum. Um, and for here, well, you you know about Fairbourne, of course. Um, Tell us a bit about Fairbourne. Yeah, well, it's a it's a coastal community largely built after the 1890s, I believe. It's it's relatively recent compared to say fishing villages like uh, Bors. It was built only just above sea level. It was, it was built on a drained salt marsh, and because of that, it's protected by a sea wall, which is a mixture of co concrete and other stuff. If you have a lot of sea level rise, plus a big storm with a storm, su storm surge, and that wall gets breached, so the argument goes, the whole village will be inundated in moments, and to a life-threatening degree. Uh, that, that's that's the official uh, stance on, on the matter, um, which has caused a lot of anxiety to the residents, obviously, because you know they they now have properties they they were struggling to sell. Um, but two and a half meters of sea level rise, you've only got to go down to Borth at high water on a, on a spring tide and see how close that is to the existing defences and of course in the big storms in 2014 on the bigger tides those defences got breached and both got flooded um, and the same goes for Everest with of course part, parts of the prom were destroyed so that's one point and uh, another point that I have to make is it doesn't just stop at two two and a half metres at the end of the century there's no off switch Unmitigated climate change, i.e. we do nothing, it just keeps rising and rising. And in in all the land-based ice on Earth, there's enough water contained to bring up sea levels by 66 metres. Now, I mean, McCumpless itself, it varies between about 15 and 25 metres above sea level. So you can see the problem there. It, it's not going to happen in, in our lifetimes. No need to worry about, about that, but in the coming centuries, what a legacy to leave to pe the, the people of Wales. I've, co I've co covered um, aspects of this in this book, office copy, um, and I wrote The Making of Innislas because I, I felt people needed to know more about sea level rise change, and I felt that the way to tell that story was to tell an account of an actual sea level rise that happened and the deglaciation after the last ice age is that story of the last 25,000 years when sea levels rose some 120 metres. So Cardigan Bay was all land at the height of the last glaciation and its drowning is the uh, tale told in this book. Could I just ask you one more question? Yeah. And it's really just to focus on um, on Machantleth again, really, because, mm. you know, this series is really about talking about people who live in this area, who know about this subject, and, you know, trying to think through what the possible impacts on Machantleth and Brodavi in general could be, and, you know, what what should we be, as, a, as well as continuing to put pressure on the government and ensuring that, you know, our politicians hear loud and clear that we need structural change, what are the types of things we should be thinking about in this area, do you think, to prepare for um, different aspects of a changing climate? I think one of the key ones we have to think about is infrastructure. Because both road and rail links in and out of Mac are prone to sea level rise. And, and of course, as we saw last week, the roads are also prone to flooding. So, yes, there are, there are projects like the new Duffy Bridge, which certainly needs to go ahead. And you, you know, I know excessive fossil fuel, fuel usage and road use is connected, but a rural area like this has to stay connected. People need to get to hospitals, schools, and what what have you. And um, 
the railway is also prone because of its low altitude. It, it, it's it's sometimes jutted on, on big spring tides. Even now, when there's a very high tide, the uh, bridge at Gandavi can be closed for a bit. A bit, you know. So, mm. um, if we have to accept there's going to be a certain amount of sea level rise, we should start planning for that. Because if you plan far enough away from an event happening, it's obviously often a lot easier to deal with than having an emergency and doing emergency repairs all the time. Of course. Bit of a funny question. Imagine you had a magic wand mm. and you could, you know, wish into existence various structural changes in this area. What would you focus on? What would you wave your magic wand to accomplish uh, to better prepare us for uh, a changing climate? I think... If if I had one ma magic wand that, that was all powerful, I'd point it at the Antarctic and Greenland ice caps and tell them to stop melting. <laughs> because that that's a that's a real threat multiplier for the Dovey Valley. Um, th th there's nothing else that compares to it. And you know, uh, in the absence of my magic wand and the absence of it, serious mitigating action, the sea levels rise and rise, the valley floor becomes like a sea lock or, or a field. And, you know, everything in front of us is sub submerged forever. What we're doing is we've got our foot right down on the gas pedal. We, we, in geological terms, I mean, I think it does millions of years on a routine basis. This is happening just like that in the blink of an eye. The peak warmth of the Holocene was reached about 7,000 years ago and it should have cooled back, back into an ice age over tens of thousands of years. So we should have, should be cooling now. But we're not. We've, we've kind of overwritten that natural cycle. In fact, our atmosphere now contains over 400 ppm of uh, CO2. The last time Earth's atmosphere contained that much was in the mid-Pliocene period. That was before any of the last ice ages. How long ago was that in years? About three and a half million. So, and the problem with the mid Pliocene is sea levels are 10 to 20 metres higher than they are now. And there was boreal forest growing in Arctic Siberia. So, that's a mid Pliocene world. Um, and I think a lot more research needs doing into the Pliocene because that's the atmosphere we've produced. And Earth's physical systems always move towards equilibrium. It's what natural systems do. So, equilibrium. With that amount of CO2 in the atmosphere means that amount of sea level rise. So you can see what we, what, what we need to do is to get it back down into a a late Pliocene stage, possibly. Um, you know, we don't we don't want another ice age either. Um, you know, in the last ice age, you couldn't have lived anywhere in in Wales because there was a kilometre thick ice sheet over the place. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, I mean, some some warming good, but not that much warming. Um, yeah. And a lot, a, lot of people, a lot of people don't get this point about the Pliocene, but it is really important. That, that, that That's the yardstick we've got to measure our, our, our CO2 levels against. Hmm. Thank you very much, John. Pleasure. Really amazing to talk to someone who's so knowledgeable about the subject. Um, if people want to um, go and take a look at the Skeptical Science website, can you just give us the URL for that? https skepticalscience or one word dot com thank you very much